Hey everybody, it's Dave. Blue Jacket 66 here for a video. This is gonna be a long video. It's probably gonna be my longest video ever. It may go an hour and a half, it may go two hours, it may go an hour, I'm not sure. To those of you new to my channel, um, if, you're, if you think you're looking for a video that's a shut up and show me the cards, just, just turn it off now. It's gonna to be too long. Uh, I'm in one of those moods to philosophize a little bit, to chat a little bit, to tell a little bit about my history. So there's a lot of videos that I click on when I'm driving. This is definitely a driver or you listen to it in three parts or you listen to it before you go to bed. Because if you think 10, 15 minutes, I'm gonna see some cards wrong. Blue Jacket 66 feels like talking a little bit uh, and that's the way it's gonna be. If you're new to my channel and you think, oh, this guy's just showing off stuff or he's bragging or he's too opinionated, uh, one of those is correct. I'm really opinionated, <clears throat> but go back before you give me that old thumbs down or click off the video, go back and look at my old videos. I've been making content for a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of my videos and proud of my collection. And I come from a long history and I have no reason to show off on YouTube. I've shown off 2% of my collection on YouTube. I've shown off 10% of my most valuable items and I will never do that. This video, is a basement rummage video, and I'll give a little history on that, that is not necessarily to show off the, the most valuable things uh, in the basement, but curiosities, interesting things, and I'm always thrilled to walk through my history in this hobby, which is extensive. Now, many of you have heard this many times, but perhaps there's new viewers. I started collecting in the early to mid 70s as a teenager, and actually pre-teenager with my father, who was a huge collector uh, and a passionate collector, starting off in coins then stamps, and then we got into baseball cards. And I'm not gonna go into the whole history of that, but we started uh, as complete novices in something that at that time in 1973 was really fun and really unique. Um, when you would, we would buy many things uh, the period through typed out periodicals, papers, uh, the antique trader, etc. And we put ads in newspapers and go to their houses. And I have tons of stories on that. But my father was a passionate collector and uh, his and my collection were separate from each other. Um, he, I would describe him as being a, what I am now, a regional food and beverage 50s guy, uh, a type collector, and he was big into uh, early tobacco cards, and uh, all the Bowmans. And he amassed a fantastic collection. And at some point I'll go over the whole, my whole history, but we're here to see a basement rummage video. But uh, he passed away in 2012. And some point it was, I had to go down to his basement. We all have our man caves. His was the basement. When I was really young, we called it the fourth bedroom, which is in a different house and upstairs. But his basement uh, was two parts. One was finished uh, and one part was unfinished. The finished part uh, is what I will call the vintage area. And I've never shown that and that little, clip that I showed at the beginning is the unfinished and that's where I'll say they're all the modern stuff is. My definition of modern is post 1980. And I know as the older we get and as years pass by, people think that's crazy, but that's my definition. Um, and so everything in that basement you saw is 75 
through 93, 92, pretty much. After 92, really not a whole lot. And what you were seeing there was sports cards and non-sports cards, primarily sports cards. Uh, a lot of those boxes, I don't know what's all in them. Some of them are gold, some of them are trash. You saw walls and walls of sets, and a lot of those boxes also were stars of the 50s, Hank Aaron cards, stars of the 70s. It's just a big mismatch. There's just tons and tons of stuff. It is a gold mine or a diamond field in the, the sense, and, it, and it's a gold mine and diamond field that I have not actively pursued. I just didn't have it in me to ever delve into his collection a whole lot. It's at my mother's house. Uh, we moved, they moved to that house when I was in college. And so that was in 82. Before that, the real gold mine was at the, the first house. But anyway, in 82, they moved there. So over the last eight or nine years, I'm a sports card guy and my dad and I w were like this. And he, what he would want is me to go down there and do and take everything and sell everything or put it in my collection and, and be happy with it. Um, but I, I never really wanted to do that. I'm not gonna lie, over the years, I've gone to that diamond field and diamond fields, sometimes you're lucky enough where there's a huge, raw, big diamond laying on the surface or you're in a gold mine and there's a vein or a nugget on the wall. And over the years, I've been walking around and I've taken that big diamond that happened to be laying on top of the field or uh, grasp out that big gold nugget uh, that was on the surface of the wall of the gold mine. But there's other stuff below the surface. Uh, and I did that initially. I just walk around and yeah, I'm gonna take that or I'm gonna take that. And over the years, uh, those surface gems were no longer there. Or if they're there, I wanted to leave them there. And so you need to chip away and dig a little bit, which means maybe getting into a box and looking through a little bit and getting some of the, the gems or the gold nuggets that are a little bit deeper. You gotta work a little bit for them. And I've done that. Um, and I'm to the point now where I have to work for the gems or the semi-gems uh, or for the pieces of quartz, meaning I really have to dig, meaning roll up my sleeves, go down there after my mother's to bed and my son's watching TV or in bed and dig a little bit. And I'm to that point and I've done that the last few trips. Um, what's interesting is almost like a diamond field uh, or treasure washing up on a beach that over the years, some of those items, sports items, that when I first started looking down there and walking around eight, nine years ago, were not gems, they were quartz. But guess what? In 2021, they are now gems. And I dug a little bit and I'd seen things completely ignored it. You go back, which I did over the weekend, take another look, and these things that were not treasures in today's market are treasures. It's very interesting. So uh, again, at the very beginning, we kind of, it's dark down there. There's boxes and boxes and boxes, and some of it is very well organized. Um, you know, I, ca I counted because I thought, huh, maybe I'll look for the second year rookie. You know, there's 25 sets of like 81 Donruss. Um, and there's lots of late 70s sets and I'll show some here. Anything between 75 and 92, there's a crap load of it. And unfortunately, 
That includes a crap load of like 1987 tops where I have boxes, I'm sorry, cases and cases and cases of unopened. And nine years ago, that was complete crap. I actually thought about putting it into the curb and now it's become quartz. And maybe at some point down the line, it's gonna be good. So I will probably figure out at some point how to move stuff out. My mom's health, unfortunately, is failing rapidly. And I have six months to a year to do a better job on this project. Because, uh, you know, when it comes to time that she passes, I don't want to be messing with that, to be honest with you. So before we get started and try to look at some of these gold nuggets, gems, pieces of quartz, stuff that I think is interesting that I did some digging for over the weekend. Uh, I, people send me uh, care packages on occasion, they get very rare, uh, but Pepino Man and, and Four Leaf Cards and John Mangini have sent me some stuff recently and I'm extremely terrible uh, I don't have everybody's address and I want to, I try to let them know I got it and thank you. And I'm going to make a, a video to thank you, but I'm, I tell everybody, if you're going to send me something, I am so bad at remembering and so it doesn't get done. And I apologize for that. But I did want to show off this that I got from DC with cardboard underground. He sent me this, uh, a couple weeks ago and it's magnificent. It's this George Brett, wonderful black and white photo with this gold autograph. And on the back, it's got all the upper deck uh, authenticity, etc. But that's, I wanted to show that on this video and because uh, it's just so great. I'm so grateful to that. I have a shelf over there. I've been encouraged to maybe put some more stuff out. Um, uh, and so I'm starting to do that. And this is, uh, right up there on that shelf. So I'm gonna show off uh, some of my stuff slash my dad's stuff. Again, the vintage side, I just choose not to photograph or talk about too much. Although I got some, there's some spattering of some vintage stuff in here, but all that basement video is primarily 75 through 92 and all the other stuff's in the finished area. I kind of keep that uh, personal. Um, his very, 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 very best stuff, of course, was in multiple safety deposit boxes. And uh, I was watching a video the other day, Mr. Fisherbike Jason, and uh, I don't know if you have your collectibles insured. I don't. I have all my, what I consider my very best stuff in safety deposit boxes and stuff that I just don't want sitting around that has value. I have, I have a bunch of safes, but I'm, that's stupid. You need, I need to get, uh, collectibles insurance. I'm obviously been cheap about it. I don't know why I've had life insurance since I was, you know, 26 years old. You, of course you insure your houses and your cars and you're smart about it. And one of my, a big asset for me is sports cards. And uh, it's just really stupid of me. So that is going to be a priority for me to, uh, probably to reach out to Mike baseball collector cause he's been doing it and, uh, find out a little more about it. And, uh, no matter what the cost is, it's gotta be worth it, if not a peace of mind. Safety deposit box, certainly, I would assume, is gonna protect me from robbery, but if the place burns down, or there's rioters, or the sprinkler system goes off, or I don't think it's a place could flood, you're not well off, not good off. So, okay, this is my preamble. Um, thanks for sticking around, and we're gonna show some stuff and show some stories. Some of it you'll have zero interest in. I'm gonna be showing some non-sport stuff, some sports stuff, some vintage sports stuff, some mo some semi-modern sports stuff, uh, com a few comics, uh, some wax. And again, these are things that I just, it just piqued, piqued my interest. And I said, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna grab that. Uh, just little this, this, and that. And, and I, could've, I could've grabbed 500 other different things and shown them instead. And I grabbed a whole bunch of things and put them on a shelf. And I said, I think I'll show these on a video. So I ended up just 
some of it. I'm gonna show it and just talk about it. So uh, let's try to enjoy. Okay, I'm back and thanks for hanging out. I thought my backdrop, uh, there's a bunch of uh, late 80s tops traded boxes. Um, I've, I brought some of those home. There's, I, there was a box that probably has a couple hundred of these in there. Um, some of the earlier 81s I had taken before, I've actually sold some of them, but it makes a pretty good uh, backdrop. Certainly junk wax, which is awesome. Okay, so I think the first thing I'll show is, uh, my dad was kind of an entrepreneur. Uh, he was big into uh, through the mail autographs and amassed, I would describe as an incredible autograph uh, collection. And most of these were uh, through the mails back in the 70s into the early 80s. My assumption is uh, most of them are legit and I've sold some of them in the past and they've been confirmed that they're all legit, but he got in touch and got to be at least friendly with uh, an artist who's at least at that time was a very popular, I think you'll recognize his artwork, artist named Bob Parker. He may have done work for Tops, and he may have done some of the back of some cards. I'm not sure. But what he did is he got him to do original artwork of some of my dad's favorite players. Uh, and then my dad would get them autographed by the players. We'd bring them to shows. He has some magnificent uh, artwork. I remember he has stars of the 50s, stars of the 40s, stars of the 60s. So you have these beautiful original pen and ink artwork of like uh, Mantle, Maze, uh, Musial, I can't actually, oh, Mantle, Maze, Aaron uh, on the stars of the 51. I mean, it's just beautiful artwork and he got them signed by uh, all those guys. Here's a very small ex example. Uh, and I just have tons of these of superstars and Hall of Famers that are done. It's just original artwork. Um, this one is, and I'm sorry, I know we got terrible glare, but it says Stan the Man, and it says led the National League uh, batters on seven occasions, his batting average, all this Hall of Fame stuff. And my dad got it autographed, Musial. It says to Carl, best wishes, Stan Musial. Um, Bob Parker is the artist. And it was really interesting. He, Whenever he would sign his work, uh, this is, he did it in 1979, he always wrote something like, hi, Carl, Bob Parker. And I think that he, that was his way of saying, hey, I, I'm not doing this artwork so you can uh, se sell it and make a bunch of money off me. I, I presume that that's why. Maybe he was just a nice guy. But all of his pieces in a different color ink, here it's green, he had personalized it to my dad. So if I would sell these, which I don't know. I mean, I've got a lot of these. Uh, of different Hall of Famers. Probably this size, I probably have, I don't know, seven. And I have these, the very large ones, stars of the 40s, stars of the 50s, stars of the 60s. I have each of those. And those are very large and they're gorgeous. But again, it's personalized. And people don't like personalized stuff. They don't like baseballs that say, uh, you know, uh, too big Jim from Hank Aaron. I mean, that's not the ball I would want either. But anyway, I thought that was cool, and it's time for me to start bringing some of this artwork home. I've never brought it home from my mom's house, ever. I've got so much stuff to go over here. Um, you know, with prices going up, people are saying I'm priced out of the hobby. I hear that a lot. That's nonsense. If you're priced out of the hobby, then you're doing something like, I only collect Mickey Mantle, or I only collect PSA 9 or higher future Hall of Famers of modern stuff. That you're, you don't have a wide enough net. That's what uh, 
Eric, those back pages, his video, he made one shortly after mine, and he says, yeah, if you think you're priced out of the hobby, you need to cast a wider net. And that's a perfect way of saying it. And it's not that anybody should tell anybody else what to collect, but if you would get a standard catalog of vintage baseball cards and go through that, you would find tons of issues you don't know about, never seen before, that are classic and very affordable. I say all this just to give you an example of something I pulled out of the basement. Again, this is all the basement good. This is a complete set, a modest complete set of 12 drink toppers from Icy, when you'd get an Icy at the 7-Eleven in 1976. And boy, 7-Eleven has hit a lot of home runs. One of my favorite basketball set is the 1972 Icy Bear set. That is gorgeous. Uh, and I've really got my eye on a, a Chamberlain. I have uh, nicely graded Maravich and Jabbar. I digress. But anyway, this is from 1976, the Cincinnati Reds team. Uh, bench, and well, here's Rose down at the bottom. Okay, complete set, 1976. These are pretty minty, I guess. Well, I'm priced out of the sports card market. No, you're not. You Cincinnati Reds fan? You can pick these things up from 4 to $15 a piece. And the, and the $15 is ones that are probably graded a 7. Take your time. Get a project. Get them raw. And you got yourself... A, is this super cool? You ever seen them before? You ever seen these before? Well, get them in your collection. Something like this. And there, this isn't unique. There's a bazillion things out there like that that you can uh, collect for on the cheap. I love this. I mean, I freaking love this. And this whole thing is probably, I don't know, $40. It's fantastic. Okay. Um, you know, periodicals was a big thing to collect back in the day. Well, I'd go to these shows in the 70s, and if you go through old magazines and stuff, uh, where they're buying and selling baseball stuff. Periodicals were really big. Old magazines and uh, who's who in baseball. And people were really into that. I found this down in the basement. This is a collector's guide to baseball cards, 1948 to 1976. Obviously, this is from, you know, 76 or so. Really interesting. I haven't really flipped through this. It doesn't give individual prices, but it kind of tops, like 1976 tops. It says the card size, the number of cards, 598, complete set value, $60, individual cards, six cents. So I love stuff like that. Here's my, my set, the 49 Bowman. Individual card values, one to 144, 90 cents. High numbers, $3.50. And you remember grading back there was very subjective. It was a little bit problematic. Uh, what the definition of mint and excellent was is not what today's are standards, but you kind of flew by the seat of your pants uh, buying like that. Um, okay, he, now here's an example, and I have several examples of that, of a gold nugget that's been sitting out in the open, and you didn't realize it was a gold nugget. Uh, I had to dig in a box a little bit and came across this, and I don't know if I'd seen it before. I don't think I had. But it is uh, the 19... I I think it's 81. I think it's Topps PGA Tour. So this is something that over the years would be absolutely nothing, uh, to be honest with you. But in 2020 and 2021, it's a little different. I thought, huh, I, well, golf cards, it's cool. I didn't know dad would ever have any golf cards. So this Nicholas in a PSA 10 is like four grand. This is not a PSA 10, it's off center. But it just, uh, it's something that uh, 
you walk past and you walk past over the years and you walk past or you didn't look for it and uh, it ends up that now it is something which is always wonderful um it's rummaging in a box it had a bunch of uh, what 1976 valentine Topps Valentine cards. It had some 77 trashed up hostess cards and a bunch of nonsense. And it had this uh, some uh, these play balls, 40 play balls. Let's see what we got here. I don't know if I'm focused, but because we got that crazy background. Let's see Jimmy Fox. Wagner. I wonder if that was mine when I, I'm a kid. It's severely pinholed up top. Connie Mack. Stengel. Cochran. Lloyd Wayner. I haven't looked at these, so that's why I'm kind of flipping through them. Geringer, Evers, Manish, Frank Frisch, Max Carey, Sisler. Haynes, Chance, Wiener. Anyway, um, vintage, pretty easy to collect set. And uh, very nice looking set. So I thought that'd be interesting to just pull out of the, I don't know what it was doing in a box with a bunch of modern stuff, but. That's the way it goes. Do you guys need to take a break? Um, here's a, you know, there's a temptation with all these sets is to go through the sets, like the 82 top set, just go through them and pull out the, the uh, uh, Ripkins or the 1980 sets to go through and pull out all the Hendersons or the 76 football, pull out all the uh, uh, Peytons, you know, on and on and on uh, for this, what I'll call modern stuff. But uh, uh, I'll be honest with you, I did look through the, some of the sets and if I saw something that was really pristine, I've pulled them before, but generally I've just let the sets be. Um, I did pull these out of the 78 set because I've got a bunch of 78 sets, but it's the Dorset rookie, and I pulled the Peyton. I think Dorset is probably undervalued. Undervalued. For those of you, and there's people that have been wanting this, my, my 1953 Bowman baseball favorite extension set that my dad and I made, I made some promises to one or two people that I would pick up some sets and send them to them. So uh, right now there's one person on my radio, uh, radar who's asked me and wanted one. So I will get you out your set uh, sooner than later. Now, let's do a couple comics. This is really interesting. This is from 1970. This, this is a magazine for comic collectors excuse the rated art our artwork but i haven't really looked through this but uh it's really interesting as you can imagine the bottom line is you're buying early marvel and dc comics for network you know for prices that now you know make us cry um Anyway, Spider-Man, you know, issues two, three, four, they went $2 a piece. So I'm going to have to look through that because uh, looking through uh, old periodicals and old stuff like that is really fun. So speaking of comics, thought I would go through a box that had my crappy old comics in it. 
these are my floor beaters that I kind of talked about my la in my last one. I remember reading this one, and this is on the floor of the card, The Swiss Family Robinson. This book is based on the Disney movie that I thought was uh, fantastic. Actually, the cover's from the movie. And another one that was on the floor of my parents' car when we were driving around this Turok Son of Stone uh, was a good one. A couple others that I pulled out of the box. I just pulled a couple out. Um, I'll show you these real quick. I did go ahead and, and bag those. Oops, oh, talking about glare. It's this Hulk 102, which is, has a fantastic cover. This shiny wrinkle you see is is because of these bags, cell phone bags. King size Hulk, number one. These are all in pretty reasonable condition, actually. Uh, these are not floor beaters. Here's a great cover. And this is kind of why I pulled these, uh, just great covers. Marvel Heroes, uh, Doctor Doom. Number 20, here's a fantastic cover, so I pulled that out of a box. This is in, uh, I think, really good condition. Hulk and the Submariner, Tales to Astonish. God, sorry about that. All that wrinkling is not the book, it's that old plastic cover. Here's a Nick Fury, number one. For a number one and being uh, Nick Fury of S.H.I.E.L.D., you think that that would have some value. It's it's really not a very valuable book. So, boy, I was pleased as punch. I was not on the surface. I was deep in this box full of just stuff. And I came across these 1969 picture pack cards, the Kansas City Royals. Royals inaugural season was 69. I was seven years old. And my dad brought us to the ballpark and I bought these picture packs. This is not the complete set, but as you will notice, the classic Blue Jacket 66 thumbtack hole, because a lot of stuff that I had when I was a kid went right up on my wall with thumbtacks. The Joe Keo. Jimmy Campanis, Roger Nelson. I think when I was in 1970 at my first my first year of Little League, it was called 811 because you played between eight and age 11 in this league. Uh, so that was the first year I played, 1970, when I was eight. And Roger Nelson was one, we had a, at our end of the year banquet, several of the Royals that time came to our banquet. And I think they spoke, I can't remember. All I remember is we had uh, breakfast, and at that age, bacon and eggs made me want a freaking gag. I only wanted to eat was Fruit Loops and Wine Punch, but I certainly remember that banquet because I have a ball from it somewhere where every uh, member of our 811 team in 1970 signed the ball, and that's one thing we got at the end of the year was this signed baseball of all our teammates. Joe Foy, uh, this is your definition of a 1969 power hitter. Uh, you know, he probably hit 20-plus home runs per year, but he was a big time power hitter for that era. Jerry Adair, old Joe Gordon was the manager, the first manager of the Royals. Mo Drabowski, pitcher. I was really, really, really happy to find that. And this is for me, finding a treasure. Okay. We're probably at the, what, 20% point? So hang on, click it off. Um, I don't get many thumbs up, but I do like to get likes. I seem to get an inordinate amount of dislikes, so I don't know why. Let's do this. I found a 1978 All-Star Ballot. So I don't know if this will focus, but we're gonna do it, and we're not gonna do it based, we're gonna not do it based on hindsight. Well, maybe we are. Yeah, we're not going to do who deserved it in 1978. I'm going to do this on these ball players are ready to play. Let's go back in time, and uh, this is who I want to see. So we'll do the National League first. Our, our, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, our choices are Burroughs, Dreisen, Garvey, Keith Hernandez, Montanez, Tony Perez, Willie Stargell, and Watson. So who do I want to see play 
with this magical team that we're creating here. I want to see Willie Stargell. Who would you want to see? Garvey? I mean, Garvey, uh, uh, Garvey may, I don't know who started that year. Okay, second base, Norm Cash, Lopez, Madlock, Joe Morgan, Sizemore, Stennett, Trio, or Tyson? Uh -huh, I want to see Joe Morgan play, and I was happy to, of course, see him play and followed and loved those big red machine teams in the mid, early, mid-70s. Shortstop, Larry Boa, Concepcion, I always love Concepcion. De Jesus, Foley, Russell, Spearer, Tavares, or Templeton? Oh, man. I'm not sure who's most deserving. But I tell you, in our uh, imaginary team here, I want to see uh, Concepcion. Your third baseman. You choose. I'll choose. Cable, Ronce, Gardner, Andaveros, Randall, Wright, Rose, or Schmidt. Okay, people. You want to see Rose, not exactly his prime, but certainly still a, a huge stud. Or uh, Mike Schmidt, who may be the second greatest third baseman ever behind George Brett. Is, now, that will give me a thumbs down from all you Philly people. I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I'm going back in time. I want to see Pete Rose play. Our catcher, Johnny Bench, Boone, Carter, Ferguson, Pokoroba, Simmons, Stearns, or Jaeger. I want to see Keith or uh, Johnny Bench play. All right, you get to pick three outfielders. And when I was voting, when I would always vote at Royal Stadium, you know, these ballots would come down the line. I, when I was really little, I don't remember voting for National Leaguers. I don't think I really, you know, I, I thought we just voted for the American League. But anyway, on this, they're both on, and I really can't remember. So, okay, three outfielders. Let's shoot this through this quickly. Dusty Baker, Lou Brock, Cedeno, Jose Cruz, Dawson, Foster, Gamble, Geronimo, uh, Griffey, senior, of course, S. Henderson, Hendrick, Kingman, Lazinski, uh, Maddox, Matthews, McBride, Rick Monday, Jerry Morales, Bobby Mercer, Parker, William Robinson, Reggie Smith. Man, I love Reggie Smith. He was such a great player with Boston. Winfield or Valentine? Okay. Number one, I watched a lot of all-star games, and I love Dave Parker, and I will watch him play in this imaginary game. <sighs> Now, this may not be most deserving, but this is who I want to see. Who do you want to see? I want to see Winfield play. And I want to see... Oh, boy. I want to see Brock. Dawson. Dawson was really dominant. Bake McBride, you want to see him play? Oscar Gamble, you know, see him stuff that fro up underneath that hat? All right, I'm just going to go with Lou Brock. Okay, the American League. Let's pick our – and then you can kind of think about, hmm, who, who really fielded a better team here? You know, it's it, the National League really dominated all-star games for a long time, but when the American League finally hit their stride – Whenever they, I can't remember when that was. They just, they dominated. Okay, American League, holy cow. Rod Carew, Chris Chambliss, uh, Cooper, Hargrove, Lee May, John Mayberry, our Royals representative. Oh, is my, Mayberry still with the Royals in 78? I think he was. Uh, George Scott or Thompson. So if you didn't pick Rod Carew, you and I are not seeing eye to eye on anything. Second baseman, Bobby Gritch, Cooper. Money, Orta, Randolph, Remy, Frank White. Frank White, he may have gotten the nod on this. I don't remember. Or, or Wills. Who do I want to see play? Oh, boy. You know, I'm going to go against Frank White, and I'm going to uh, 
Bobby Gritch. He was underrated and fantastic in there. Our shortstops, Bellinger, Burleson, Campaneras, Dent, Mullinex, Freddie Patek, who I, of course, voted for, Smalley, and Yount. Let's see, Yount. Okay, third baseman. Bell, George Brett, Hera, Hobson, Hal, Murray, Nettles, Soderholm. We're watching George Brett play. Your, you guys' vote does not count. Catcher, Carlton Fisk, Ray Fossey, Mun Munson, May, Porter, Downing, Sundberg. Let's go back in time and watch Thurman Munson play. Fisk may have been the better knob back then, but uh, let's see. Let's let's watch Munson play. And our three outfielders. Here's our choices: Baylor, Bonds, Senior, Bostic, Cowens, Al Cowens, Hissel, Reggie Jackson, uh, Rupert Jones, Kemp, Lafleur, Chet Lemon, Lescano, Fred Lynn, Manning, Al Oliver, Amos Otis with my Royals. He would have got my check. I guarantee it. Page, Rice, Rivers, Rudy, Singleton, Staub, Washington, Claudel Washington, Yastrzemski, and, Z and Zisk. So I want to see, you s I don't think about this, but I definitely want to see Yaz play again. I want to see Reggie Jackson, late 70s Reggie Jackson, of course. So who else are we going to pick here? Fred Lynn, <clears throat> he's fantastic then, freaking fantastic. But maybe there's someone else you want to see. Bond Sr. Uh, Joe Rudy playing left field for the A's. Was Rudy still with the A's in 78? I don't know. Jim Rice. Let's watch Jim Rice. So there's my 1978 ballot. I don't know if you agree. And, you know, it's, it'd be interesting to go back and find out who actually the starters were. Because back then, I never voted an all-star ballot for the greatest players. Uh, I voted for Hank Aaron when he did not deserve to be playing the outfield. And I, uh, you know, I voted for w Willie Mays in, you know, 1971. <laughs> Heck yeah, I did. You want to watch you all-star game? You want to watch those guys? You don't want to watch the best players? Shoot. <clears throat> Okay, anybody know anything about wrestling? Because I found uh, a whole crap load of, I think these are 40s or 50s, it's gorgeous George, uh, wrestling exhibits. And I've been online and I don't think they have a lot of value, but I think I'm gonna keep them because, I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's awesome all these wrestling exhibits. So if you know anything about old wrestling, which people do, card cutter, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you out there, but I know nothing about old wrestling. What I do know a little bit about, and check this out. Well, let's look at this first. I found this book. When I was in grade school, you had book day, right? And you're always very excited about book day. Number one, you had that cheesy paper. Now, nowadays, it seems later you had that little paper where you checked off what you wanted. But in book day, when I was in grade school, and I was born in 62, so I was in grade school, you know, from whatever, 66, 67 on up, book day was big because you'd go in the library and they would have all these tables set up and they would have these books out and you would... Let your mom know, mom, tomorrow's books day. Can I have some money for books? And she would, or your father would presumably give you a couple bucks. Books, books were not expensive. This was 50 cents. And uh, you would buy books. Maybe you would be into uh, nonfiction books. I tended to buy sports books. And I was big into like Ripley's Believe It or Not. But this is a book I bought uh, the, let's see what the date is on this. Yeah, yeah this is, I don't know why it was at book day, but this is from 1961. But this, I have a whole bunch of books that I bought on book day. 
And this was obviously a, not a first printing, but uh, Mickey Mantle, the indispensable Yankee. They must have made a series. Number two is Musial Williams. Then they had a book on the best managers. I pulled that. Um, how about some wax? Heck yeah. Heck yeah, I pulled some wax out of there. There's, that basement is Wax City. Got myself an Elvis out of a case. Got myself an 82 wax box. Thirty-five cents for this wax box. <laughs> Whatever. I have so much of this. I could shingle my house, your house, your neighbor's house, and uh, the whole block. I got so many of these wax boxes of this nineteen ninety sky box. Um, I actually brought a case of it home. But I opened the case and pulled this out so we could show the video. Why didn't I just keep the case sealed? Uh, I've got more cases. And I love junk wax. 93 Donruss, Series 1, Series 2. Why not? It's not like I got a place to store it, but it's got to go. Okay, another... Uh, little pull here and I don't know why this was over in the modern stuff but uh, uh, this is really good and sorry about this glare these, these are W554 uh, uh, cards this is Lefty Grove these are somewhat rare and actually there's two of them they were just laying about uh, I went ahead and found a plastic thing and put them in That was kind of a neat thing to grab. And back in line of, hey, I can't afford, I'm priced out of the hobby. Nonsense. Uh, here's some early, uh, Spick and Span in the Milwaukee area was a dry cleaner place and they put out cards uh, from the 50s, early 50s, up through 60, I think. Uh, I think I can't remember when the first issue was. It's 51 through 54, but that's what these are. Uh, and I have no idea how you got them. But uh, they're a cool issue. They're just blank back. Uh, sorry about the glare. But these, come on now. You're a Milwaukee fan? There's a, so much stuff out there that's inexpensive. This stuff is not expensive. Luber Debt. Chet Nichols, Danny Olamel or something like that. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. And uh, here's Pafco. So stuff like this uh, is, come on, it's affordable. There's so much out there to collect. So much goodness. I like... Uh, uh, Kellogg's 3D. I love them. And the, and the uh, NFL Players uh, Association also has put out 3D sets. So th I think this is 80. You know, this is 1972, a complete set of those. I'm really working on a complete run of those, but I saw this in a box, and uh, I don't really remember if I have the 72 or not, so I thought I'd grab that, 72. You collect these. You like uh, Roberto Clemente? He's got a lot of great Kellogg's 3D cards that are very, very, very affordable. Um, okay, this is cool. Um, it's in this box. In, I can't even describe it to you. This is not an organized box. This is a trash box. I mean, a literal trash box. And uh, got these un unopened packs, 1977 uh, cloth stickers. So there's a lot of wax and unopened wax down there that I 
like. So that's pretty cool. 1977 cloth stickers. I think I've shown my complete set of 77 cloth stickers not too long ago within the last couple months. Uh, more laying around in there. This is gold, uh, really gold. Um, this is uh, 1977's Series 1. with an extra sticker in every pack, Star Wars. Uh, I was very happy. I was so happy to find those that I uh, frantically, frantically looked through that box, which I don't normally do. I looked through that box uh, trying to find more. I did get Hold on a second. Well, I don't know where it is. I did find a... Uh... Huh. I'm completely unorganized. Hold on. Well, I did find some more Star Wars. Oh, here they are. Now, this is an example of the multiple bazillion boxes there. This crappy old box. It says Pacific Trading Cards in Edmonds, Washington. Then it's my dad, Carl Berg, back at our old house on 96th Street. Hence the Blue Jacket 66. Uh, uh, 96th Street was right off of Blue Jacket and we moved there in 66. So anyway, I open this up and here's more Star Wars cards. I have six or seven complete sets of the Star Wars with stickers. Um, this is not another complete set, but I don't think it is. I, I don't know, but it's it's primarily the the blue and uh, the green, which I th isn't the green. This is that this Empire Stripe. Is that series two? Anyway, I am so big into those Star Wars cards. I love them, and those are fantastic to put in binders. But uh, these those wax packs are cool. Okay, um, I saw this little box and uh, I, I, you just have to just grab a box and look at it. You can't sit there and go through all, all these boxes. I just happened to eye a box and it said 1992. So it was a 1992 Topps basketball and it's got this perfect, I think. I looked it over pretty good. Uh, it was just in with the set. It was just a set of 92, but I took this out and sleeved it the shack rookie and i went ahead this is one of those things where i just ditched the set to be honest with you i just pulled the cards and uh, i pulled the jordans and uh ditched the set i think that jeter was nearby So a Shaq rookie, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I didn't, see, the funny thing is, I don't remember seeing basketball cards down there. And the last few times where I've done a little bit of digging, where I've gone away from the surface, where I get down in a box a little bit, I'm finding more uh, basketball. So I just, I, I just st stuck them in here. Um, Oh gosh, I'll show you this. I just decided to grab these. It's very painful to, uh, I'll be honest with you, to load up all this stuff.
But these are uh, 18 complete mint 1977 Topps basketball sets. So I brought home 18 sets of 1977 Topps basketball. So I'm not sure what to do with that. I don't like leaving them in these old boxes that haven't been opened for freaking 40 years. Uh, and I'm really lazy to put that many sets in binders. Uh, I do, I already have a nice minty 77 set in a binder. And I don't, I don't like putting cards in, I love cards in binders, but I'm really lazy about putting them in. Um, so, but I also don't like them sitting around. I've got behind me, you can't see about 40 sets from the 70s football, baseball, uh, basketball that they're in these type of boxes and Jesus, I don't know, that's not good. Okay, here's something else uh, I found when I was uh, right next to that 92 basketball was uh, 92 baseball. These look really good uh, to me. Um, it's a nice David Robinson, 91 Robinson. And uh, I just pulled some fi some finest, just the original. I love that, that 93 finest is it, just dear to my heart. It was completely different. It was fantastic. And I know these non-refractors don't have tons of value, but uh, I grabbed a Griffey, a Bonds, a Ripken. I already have a couple sets of that. And then... What is this? Is this 95? Finest. Grab the Jeter and uh, uh, Griffey. These are, again, stuff that uh, maybe had I seen before, which I may have. I don't even, I don't, I don't remember. Um, I just wouldn't have had any interest in and just actually just would pass it by with my eyes but stuff's you know stuff's gained in value just over the last few years um let's do another comic so i found this was my one of my childhood boxes this is the limited collector's edition the big it's this big huge shazam uh book because uh i got the issue one of the comic book of that uh, actually, I wonder how many issues I got because that and Plastic Man came around around the same time and I had the number one Plastic Man, but that was just seemed to be a terrible book. Where I really loved the Billy Batson and Shazam when that came out uh, mid-70s. So uh, I had kept this. Um, and it's in okay condition. What it is, it's for me to read, right? Um, here is my... Number one issue, uh, an SGC 9.6 of my original issue of Sazam. And I bought this after the fact. I bought this within the last year or two because this is one of those that I'd gotten when I was a kid. It was a, a number one issue. And uh, I remember as a kid thinking, okay, it's a number one issue. This is important. And I read it and I read it and I read it and I read it. And it eventually became you know, a reader book and and lost and never to be seen again. So as an adult, I had to rebuy that, which I am a big uh, advocate of rebuying your childhood. That's why I have a lot of vintage Hot Wheel cars and board games and uh, collect all sorts of stuff. Oh, this video is going on long. Um, Okay, so I came upon a set of 1991 boxing cards, and I wasn't sure what they were, so I looked up, and some of them, you know how things are nowadays, it's got to be a PSA 10, but are, have some significant value to them. So out of the cards, I pulled... Uh, the Ali's and the Foreman's and 
what I thought were good cards. So I think that's cool. I'll go through that. And, you know, what I need to figure out is, hey, are any of these cards uh, worth grading? Which is always a consideration now with these prices. you got to figure, do I want to wait that long? And is there value in grading? And there may be on some of these. Which, so speaking of that set, I found uh, some wax boxes. The 91 All World Boxing. 1991 Premier Edition. So I got one box, wax, two, three wax boxes of that, which I will, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, put in the old big Tupperware container for Caden. Um, I got some other wax that I grabbed there that I thought was good. Uh, this 1992 Impel X-Men wax box and the 94 Fleer X-Men. They're both X-Men. Those are pretty good finds. Okay. So we're kind of winding down here. Uh, Maybe a little bit of clickbait by saying vintage, but maybe some of this stuff is vintage to you and it's not for me, but I didn't wander over to the vintage side. Maybe sometime I'll do some vintage, but <clears throat> here is a what I consider to be a couple big wrestling finds. I don't know jack about wrestling cards, but wrestling cards are, are really shooting up. And you look at some of these prices of Hulk Hogan cards. What it is, is his 82 is his quote unquote rookie cards. It's huge bucks. And his 85, huge bucks. So I don't know much about this. This is a 1991 World Championship Wrestling wax box. I grabbed that. And then, uh, <laughs> I was in this box, and I know I've looked through this box before because it's got some Kellogg's 3D in it. And there's Kellogg's 3D, you know, parts of sets and full sets and, and here and there and ones that are still in wrappers that were in the cereal. And I know I've been in that box before because I like the Kellogg's. And for some reason, night before last, I was, I was like, I, I want to go to bed. And I thought, maybe I'm just going to go down the basement one more time because I, I want to grab... Uh, a junk wax box because I always like coming home with like an 87 or whatever tops box. I just, it's my little ritual to bring one little piece of wax box so my mother feels better that I'm getting stuff out of there. So I go over to kind of rummage around in the wax box and I saw this little box there with the Kellogg's in it and there's a bunch of pristine looking cards stacked within that box and I'm like, I wonder what those are. Well, I'll show you what they are. This is the, uh, what is it, 85 World Federation Wrestling Cards. Now this card here, you know, I know prices are up and down and I'm not here to talk about prices, but we've got to talk about prices because it's kind of exciting to find this. So, so I looked this up and in a PSA 10, this is going for like 15 to $18,000. Uh, and these cards are pristine, although the centering is not PSA 10. So, you know, a nines are, you know, two grand. How, are they going to be five times that much in a week? Or are they going to be a dollar in a week? I don't know. But anyway, so I found that. And with it was this. And this. And this, and this, and this. That, my friends, is finding the diamond or the gold nugget on the surface and having walked by it and not given a crap for nine years. And all of a sudden, that little piece of rock 
became quartz and is now gold. And I got a crap load of them in it. That's pretty cool. So I saw those, so I immediately kind of got online and said, which of these cards in each set are good? So stickers, gold. Andre the Giant. So I thought that that was uh, super cool. Those one cards are super, super cool. I think this is from a, yeah. Anyway, I thought that that was, uh, I was actually excited about that when I, when I started going through these cards, just laying there, and I see this, I was like, holy, holy moly. I mean, if those were 10s, I wouldn't be going to work on Monday, but they're not. Um, so, what is the moral of this story? I just want a couple thoughts out of all this. Number two, number one, is our collecting, the stratosphere we, we live in, there's so much out there. And stuff that you may, I can't collect now, things are out of my price range. They're not. There's all sorts of stuff. If you just do a little work that I know you would enjoy, and because I'm doing the exact same thing, believe me. I'm doing a lot of low-grade Marvel stuff. I actually, you know, got online. And uh, picked this up last week. Now, this is not something I would do ever in the past. But not a lot of money at all. It's Star Wars. And it's fun. So there's, there's a lot of fun. Everybody knows I collect 50s cards, 50s food and beverage, regional issues, pre-war stuff. I don't know squat really about modern stuff, and I admit it. I don't, I don't, let me say it again. I don't know squat really about modern stuff, although I have some modern stuff. But right now, those higher grade 50s cards and regional cards that I love so much, they're really... I'm not comfortable buying at those prices. And that may be stupid because they may be worth five times more in 10 years or two times more in a week. And I'm not, not buying thinking things are going to come back down because I don't know that that's to, to be true. I have no idea. But I am saying I like sports cards. I like non-sports cards. I like comics. What can I get that makes me feel good and more importantly is fun? And there's a lot out there at low price. And you know what? Those things that are low price now, in 10 years, may be your retirement. You don't know. So I would collect in these times what you are enjoying, and if it works out, great, monetarily. And if it doesn't, you have a bunch of shit you really like. Look at that background. That's not valuable stuff, but I love it. I wish I could put that display above my headboard because uh, it's fun. So that was a little bit of a basement rummage. And I didn't want it to be something like, hey, I pulled out these $30,000 cards out of my dad's basement, look at it. That's not fun. Um, What's fun is little stories about little finds and little gems that at one time were not so gems. And that's the way your collection may very well be. I've said it once and I'll say it again. I've been collecting a long time and there is not many things that I have bought 
and save that are worth less now than they were then. Now, obviously, things that I bought in the 70s or early 80s are, are not go down in price. That rarely happens. But my point is things that were very, very inex inexpensive, e even recently, I think have potential. And more importantly, they have potential as being an important part of your collection that 40 down, years down the road, you're going to be very happy to have. What you're probably not going to be very, is a, is a hobbyist, what is not going to make you happy is the fact that you bought a, uh, uh, a 69 Clemente PSA 5 for X amount of money. And uh, two months later, you sold it and picked up 40 bucks on it. 30 years down the line, that's not going to make you happy. Um, it is going to make it ha you happy that when you're showing it to your grandchildren uh, or your, your uh, adult children that, hey, uh, this is my card and I remember getting it in 2020. I'm not a hypocrite, though. I don't keep everything. I sell. I've got to, I've got to turn stuff over to get stuff uh, that I want more. I tend to sell stuff that I never really had a big interest in that has some value. And on occasion, I do sell something that is important or I really like in my collection, but I have to move it because there's something that's come up that it really would mean a lot to me and I think is unique. I try to buy cards and items that are not easy to get. When I get a catalog from Robert Edwards auction or Golden comes online or any other auction house, the first thing I do is run through every item in that auction for something that you don't see every day, okay? I can get a 1954 Hank Aaron any day of the week. I can get a 1952 Topps Mantle any day of the week. Now, that doesn't mean I have the cash to get it, but what I'm saying is they're not rare. They're not even uncommon. But when a dice game mantle comes up and people are emailing me, did you see the dice game? Those come up once every 10 years. I can't afford that either. My point being is I go through those catalogs for things that, hey, this is the time to get this. It may not be available again. I only see this every couple of years. This is what... Uh, I'm gonna go for and I put in initial bids on all those things. I may get none of them. I always hope that I get one, but that's when I start my bidding, I run through a catalog for things that, hey, you don't see that every day. You know, when a 68 uh, uh, Topps 3D te test issue for Clemente came up all those years ago, that was it, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, the 68 Tops Clemente, you can get any day of the week. And not everything that you don't see every day is costly. You ever seen those spick and span uh, uh, premiums that I showed? You don't see them every, every day. Uh, with the internet, you, if you look for them, you would find them. And they're so inexpensive. And that's what's so great about this hobby is you cannot begrudge the man that is spending $2 million on a card. You cannot begrudge the person that's budget is $30 a month for trading cards. My dad was a school teacher. I guarantee you his budget <laughs> was very, very low. But the way all great collectors do, they buy what they love. And when it turns into gold, it's, it's just gravy. Otherwise, it doesn't turn into gold <laughs> and you've got this fantastic thing that you love. I have a lot of non-sports stuff that has no value, but is a premier part of my collection. So get off your duff. 
quit complaining that prices are high and staying up at night wondering if they're going to drop. Keep collecting and collect what you love. Thanks for watching. I'm sure there'll be more of these. I'll probably at some point move into the high end part of this ongoing basement rummage. Um, but I have actually more fun showing uh, these little hidden curiosities that are so much fun. Thanks for staying with me. Uh, looks like it's been a, a little over an hour. I am very grateful. For this hobby. Uh, and people that are new to the hobby and you're doing your YouTube videos that do nothing but talk about eBay prices and you're nothing but charts. I welcome you to the hobby. Have a great afternoon.